Hey man, I'm Green Arrow writer and comic book fan Kevin Smith. Join me today on DC Daily. and welcome to DC Daily. I am Amy Dallin and today I'm very excited because I am joined by Sam Levine and our friend Harley Quinn Smith. Plus, you brought your dad, Kevin Smith. I did. I brought my dad to work. In a bid to seem <laughs> relevant, I begged my daughter to bring me to her job today. I, I, I have no <laughs> venues in the middle of a quarantine to get myself out there. So this is the best chance to remind people of the most important thing I could ever communicate to them. I made clerks once. <laughs> you also, for our purposes, you made some comics and some DC TV and a lot of our favorite things. Thank you. Uh, so we're so thrilled that you can be here. And Harley, it's so nice to see you. It's so good to see everybody. And Kevin, welcome back. I mean, I, I know I wasn't there the last time you joined us at DC Daily. As far as I remember, it's been like 400 episodes since I've seen you. So this is a wonderful treat for me. When they hired me for the first, it wasn't even the first official episode, but when we streamed, yeah. I was like, can I be on the show every week? And they're like, but your daughter can be. And then that was that. So <laughs> it's not cool and hip and young enough. That's literally what happened. That's oh, a true wow. story, man. Like she went and she met about doing DC Daily. And she said that the person she spoke with was like, we, we love your dad, but we're looking to a, a younger generation. <laughs> and right then and there, I felt like I was I, I, I was Kurt Swan. I was an old timer all of a sudden. You always say that I'm you, and I'm just the younger, hipper girl version. That's not, that's <laughs> not how I say it. I say you're the beardless, beardless <laughs> <man>. <laughs> I'm the younger, cooler version. Look, I'm just happy she has a job. So thank you, DC Daily. <laughs> brings us right into our questions for today, I think, which is, how are you doing? Getting sick of each other yet? We have a big enough house where, like, we don't have to be in each other's faces. So it, I, we haven't been in each other's throat. But I do remember early in the quarantine getting into, like, honestly, one of the only fights that I've ever gotten <laughs> into with my kid, where she was giving me the silent treatment <laughs> and, and writing very snarky texts, very snarky texts. And I discovered who my, you know, my daughter, as much as I'm always like, oh, she's just like me. She is like me. And as much as she can't let it go and refuses to lose an argument. So even though you cogently throw out, you're like, well, this is why my friend had gloves on. And it was OK that he comes in because we shoot live streams up on our uh, my deck with uh, Fat Man Beyond and with uh, Jay and Silent Bob, uh, Get Old, and the various little shows I do. After that, I had to start going, hey, Harley, can... <laughs> Jay, come over. He's wearing two pairs of gloves and three masks. And he'll go around the opposite side of the house, not in the front door. He'll go up the back and around. He'll scale down a hill to get into the back. And then she either proves it or no. It's it's like Gladiator, where she puts out her thumb and you're like, which way is it going to go? And then sometimes it's that. You're making me sound like a tyrant. Not a tyrant. But she, 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 she it's, it's very beautiful because we live in our house. It's not just me and the kid. My wife has to live with us too. That's part of the deal. Uh, but also uh, my wife's parents, uh, my my in-laws, uh, Byron and Gail, her nan and pop, have lived with us since she was born, essentially. So her whole thing isn't even about her getting germs or anything. She is like deathly afraid because they're older, they're in their 70s and stuff. So she's been playing like literally germ Batman or that woman in, in the house uh, for the last like month, uh, the most militant of all of us. And sometimes, yeah. you know, it's irritating. And then sometimes you're like, what, as you watch statistics, you're like, maybe the kid has got the right idea. So for Harley and to uh, Harley, we say thanks, Kapuka. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so but since you've been stuck there, have you guys picked up any fun hobbies like baking or collecting kittens? Um, <laughs> <laughs> These are my babies. This is Minnie. Hi. Oh. Hi, baby girl. Hello. She is, um, may or may not be my favorite. Um, she's so, so right. fluffy and so small. And this. Carol, Carol Baskin over here. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> and this is Mouse. Hello, Mouse. Oh, what cuties! Mouse, mouse. Oh. 
So together they're Minnie and Mouse, and they're so cute, and they can sit here the whole time we live stream. They're, pre they're <laughs> pretty, pretty darn adorable. Okay, so you have worked on this wonderful furry family together, but that is not all you have done together. I want to say a big congratulations from us on Jay and Silent Bob Reboot, which came out last year. Thank you. Uh, yeah. What was it like working together on that, specifically being like, Harley, you're going to play someone's daughter? Uh, you can begin. Thank and you. All that. <laughs> um, it, for me, it was great. I mean, I'm a dad, and I get to work with my kid, and that's phenomenal. Something I never foresaw when we had a kid or throughout most of her life. She was never into, like, movies or acting. I mean, she watched them, but she was never like, I want to do that. She was into music, you know, and, and I couldn't do anything. I, I'm not musical at all and stuff. So I was like, I could take you to band practice. I could buy a guitar, but that's about as helpful as I can be. But, you know, once she showed interest in acting, I stuck her in a scene in Tusk and she was like, I like this. And I'm like, oh, like, I, I know a thing or two about acting. Like, I, I know I, I know movies like I, that's what I do. Like when Harley was a kid, kid, like a small kid, about five or oh, something. This is. No, no. It's, 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 it's here I'm in this. Sit back. This is a long story. It's not long. I'll truncate it. It's sad. It's I will, really upsetting. It's not sad. Yeah, uh, Harley. <laughs> Harley and I were playing uh, uh, hide and seek upstairs. She's five years old, so naturally repetition is in the air. So you know you don't play one game of hide and seek. We were on our twelfth game of hide and seek. Hide and seek in a bedroom where like there's not really many places to hide. You can only go beyond the curtain so many times. But she was having a blast. Um, I, as the adult, was just like, all right, man, like game 12. That's enough for today. We will play hide and seek tomorrow. And we never played hide and seek again. Not in a way where she was like, fuck you, old man, or something like that, where she didn't want to. <laughs> but we just never did it. We never got back around to playing hide and seek. And then one day I turned around and she was like 18. And that's completely inappropriate to play hide and seek at that point. So I felt bad. I was like, oh, my God, I am that Harry Chapin Carpenter song, Cats in the Cradle. Like, I totally missed my window. I, I always said I'd be better than that. And I wasn't. When she showed an interest in acting, I was like, Oh my God, this is my chance to play that last game of hide and seek. I'm going to be a guy that, that doesn't talk. Like that's my big pretend because obviously I can't be that in real life. You're going to pretend to be that guy's daughter, Jay's daughter, not mine and go. And you know, and in the same time we rolled cameras and got to capture a movie. Jay and Silent Bob reboot is a big Jay and Silent Bob strike back reunion where, you know, like, Oh look, all these people are still alive. Thank God. Although they're older, that's for sure. So I was always worried for the kid that they were going to shred her. Like, just like people be like, oh, this movie, he always keeps putting his kid in and stuff like that. And mercifully, like people like her performance took it beyond that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you really had to you'd have to hate hard on on me or her to be like, oh, that, that she was not good in that movie. She's wonderful in the movie as an actress, separate from me altogether. She pulled off like a pretty difficult role in as much as like if you're there to see Jane Silent Bob reboot, you're there to see Jane Silent Bob. And all of a sudden there's a kid. There's a there's a chance the audience might have turned on her and been like, oh, but instead they embraced her. And that was, for me, everything. You? Be as eloquent. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was so rude. Well, that's, uh, I mean, you touched on a lot. <laughs> um, it was, it, it was so much fun. Um, I obviously love my dad, um, but I also love Jay so much and getting to play Jay's daughter was such a great honor and we've watched him become a dad and then getting to play his daughter in a film was kind of like a full circle moment I felt and he he's wanted to be a dad forever and ended up being no offense literally the best dad ever yeah so. exactly. i would i'd give him full marks he's better than me as a dad i thought i was pretty good as a dad but like jason is the ultimate jason dad. would play hide and seek a hundred times there would be no sad story There's, in jay's life exactly. jay has no you know come to jesus conversation where he's like i missed my opportunity jay's still in the middle of a hide and seek game with yeah. his kid it's true also uh, my my kittens i've never really like witnessed you do your thing so my so minnie's just watching you as you're like throwing your hands everywhere and she's like what are you doing and just like the real world there's two of them one is kind of interested in me the other has his back to me and it's like i would much prefer to watch a judd apatow movie <laughs> 
Well, as a fan, I, I have to tell you guys uh, how excited I am to have Millennium Falcon and Mr. Taint here. But if we can keep it in the viewers universe for one second, what can you tell us about Twilight of the Mole Rats? Is this really happening? Uh, it, it looks like it. Yeah, uh, we were trying to do it years ago. And it's kind of where Jane Silent Bob reboot came from. The first version of a Mallrats 2 that I wrote like five years ago, like I wrote it with the intention of Harley playing Brody's daughter Banner. And then when I couldn't get that movie made and suddenly I was like, oh, we can make Jane Silent Bob reboot instead. I took big portions of that old Mallrats script wow. and turned it into reboot. So the entire third act of reboot is stolen from that first version of the Mallrats 2 script, including Iron Bob. Um, and instead of it being Brody's daughter, it became Jay's daughter. So now I'm kind of at ground zero for starting a new Mallrats sequel. And so this one called Twilight of the Mallrats um, it goes in a different direction than the old one did. It's, it's more grounded in reality. Like in the previous one, Brody was literally John McClane trying to save the mall from terrorists, Canadian terrorists. Um, in this one, it more closely resembles Mallrats, which is literally just a day in the life. Like, you know, uh, it, it shouldn't be incredibly antic, like, because Mallrats isn't. And, and I started thinking, like, all right, so if you like that movie, like, and you come to sit down after 25 years and say, like, I want to watch Mallrats too. If we gave you Die Hard in the Mall, wouldn't you be like, that's, well, that's different. Uh, that's not the movie. That's not Mallrats at all. If we gave you a day in the life between Brody and, and, and his daughter and everybody you know from that previous movie and stuff and how it echoes, eerily echoes the previous movie, like almost scene for scene and stuff, then people are like, oh, this resembles, like this more closely resembles Mallrats. I just finished the first draft. I'm now collecting notes from people that I've given the draft to to be like, what do you think? What should I change and stuff? It's um, it's turned into something really uh, special and fun, but uh, it takes place at a mall, which um, has now been, the story has to be informed by what's gone on, by the quarantine. When I started writing it back in December, this version of it, you know, there was no quarantine. Uh, now, as we've lived through it, we know that the world is never gonna look the same. So it's gonna be a long time before we see commerce done the way it was prior to the quarantine and malls were dying prior to that quarantine as well. So there's no way that it can't inform the story that we're gonna tell. So I started weaving that in as well. And I, I think anybody that's telling a modern story is gonna to have to acknowledge what we just went through. This is a history changing event, but the, the script's done. Uh, I do one more draft and then we submit it to Universal and, and go like this. It's very good. Yay! Mm -hmm. I, I will good. say, you are claiming that nobody liked Mallrats, but I think Sam will back me up that uh, a lot of us did, and it meant a lot to us, and it got us through some uh, very difficult times. What are you all holding on to in these times? Is there any DC TV or movies that you are binging right now? I finally got the chance, because we were on the road with the movie and stuff, to watch the Harley Quinn animated series, the cartoon. Oh, it, it's, wow. it is irritatingly good. I, I, the, <laughs> yeah. the moment Batman shows up and Joker goes, this fucking guy. I was like, <gasps> and then I was mad because I'm like, why didn't I ever go in and be like, can I do a show where all they do is curse? Like, that would be fun. <laughs> but it's not just the cursing. It's like the storytelling is really wonderful. The voice uh, characterizations, the performances, really great. The way it plays with DC history, it is spellbindingly good. And then they did that wonderful thing where they were like, oh, by the way, here's season two. It is so good. It makes you mad that you didn't do it first, but at the same time, I watch it and I'm like, I never would have done it like this. I'm raised and weaned on Batman the Animated Series and stuff, so I'd be like, oh my God, we have to do that, we have to do that. This generation found a way to tell this story and with these same characters, make it completely fresh and bring me back in. They are breaking ground here. I'm so happy with that. Um, and then it's not, it's DC adjacent, but and it happened before, but I have been re-watching it during quarantine just as a feel-good go-to is uh, Watchmen was, oh, yeah. oh, blew my mind. That was one of those things makes you want to quit and stop <laughs> calling yourself a storyteller where you're like, and, and again, it's all the things I always doubt. Like I remember when they announced it, I'm like, all right, Watchmen, finally, somebody's gonna do Watchmen right, 12 episodes on HBO or whatever. And they're like, no, 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 it's not the book. It's a sequel to the book. And you're like, what? 
Why? What a waste of time. And then they give it to you and you're like, this is, it, it's not saying it's better than the Watchmen. This is better than anything I could have asked for because what they did was ingest the Watchmen and tell a story in the vein that you, you felt when you read it. I read Damon Lindelof was saying, I just wanted to capture the essence of what I felt like when I read Watchmen for the first time. And they went above and beyond that. They told a masterful story. It inspires me. It makes me want to write better. That was creative fuel for me. I'll never make anything as good as that or anything even like that. But knowing it exists and how it made me feel, that fed my spiritual creativity. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I'm speaking too much. We should just do show and tell. I've got oh, some art Jesus that's God. been hanging around the house. <laughs> this is a piece that Bruce Tim drew. You're scaring my cat. Sorry. When <laughs> Harley was born. It's uh, commemorating the birth of Harley Quinn. <laughs> a Bruce wow. Tim original. That Dave Mandel, the guy who does Veep, and he also did that uh, a wonderful, uh, he, did the, he did something for, for DC as well. Um, he, he had that commission. This is the cover of... Uh, Green Arrow, the onomatopoeia cover that Matt Wagner drew. This is my favorite yes. piece of artwork in the world. Cover art is a completely different skill. And Matt like distilled the entire arc down to this amazing image. And I remember being like, please, can I, can I have that? Can I have that? So I bought all the covers of, of my entire Quiver run. But most of them hang in the store in uh, Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash in Red Bank. But this one I always keep in my office because I... I just love it. It says so much about comics, all the onomatopoeia surrounding the character of onomatopoeia. It's not just the idea like, hey, that's my character on a DC comic. It's such a great graphic uh, representation of a comic book concept, something that doesn't really work in the real world. Like on the page, onomatopoeia is a great character. But so like, pretty. If you did them in TV, it'd be so weird. Or if you did them in movies, like a guy going drip and people are like, what the... Like, but on the page, <laughs> reading it all works so well. You're so hyper and wild. I, I love, I love DC Comics. This <laughs> is a double page splash spread from Green Arrow <laughs> that Phil Hester and Andy Parks drew. He's got Black You're Manta too in it. close to my cat. He said about the cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, behind us, this is a piece that Jim Lee drew in my house of Harley Quinn. Let me move you closer to see if you can get it. <laughs> I'm talking about it if you can. Jesus. Just to get him closer. There you go. Oh my gosh. Jim Lee came over and did an episode of uh, Fat Man on Batman years ago. And while he was doing the episode, he literally drew that. He was just sitting there drawing it while he was answering questions. And when it was done, he was like, here, give this to Harley. And it's a, a, a drawing of Harley that he's done. And Harley's got two marionette puppets, one of the Joker and one of Batman. It's breathtaking. And now Jim is doing that wonderful thing where he's doing all the drawing, uh, all those drawings he's doing for to raise money. Like I've seen some of his pieces and it reminds me of that. Like just watching him sit there and draw while I was asking him questions. What a gifted folk. Um, and then right over here, man, is like a print I bought for Batman, uh, Zuren Ra, ah, remember that? Like, I don't know if you could see it from here, but it's a beautiful, Stop. A beautiful oh, piece. The and it's got a little Batmite in it as well. <laughs> so there's a lot of DC art all over this house. You walk around the house, man. I, I pick up the laptop, but obviously it's disturbing the kid. But all over the house, it's like, it's, it's stuff that I've always loved and also I, stuff I've worked on. I wish we could go in my room. Yeah. Her room is like, you know, you died and went to Harley Quinn heaven. Since we have you both here, we thought that it would be fun to do a mini read-along of one of your other creations, your arc of Green Arrow, a piece of quiver that you did with Phil Hester. I'm, I'm all for that, man. I, I can, with the caveat that I don't do funny voices. So you're just gonna, it's gonna sound like Kevin Smith doing it, but I look forward to reading Edgerkin because he's got that rhyme patois. So there's a line, I don't think it's in episode eight or in issue eight, it might be seven, but he references like uh, what rough thing toward Bethlehem slouches. Like it was, I sat there going like, I, you know, I'm no Eminem, but this ain't bad. <laughs> oh, That's the perfect intro. Sullivan, will you be Batman for us? I will always gladly be Batman. Uh, Harley Quinn Smith, will you read Red Arrow for us? I'd be honored too. 
And I dibs to Dinah because, of course, I did. So we're in the Star City safe house of Jason Blood, uh, and the rest of the crew are sort of outside, and they are rushing in only to find that Etrigan's been attacking Ollie, who then goes, poof, right out of the world. Uh, so they're all coming to the best possible conclusion, obviously. Here's, here's my Etrigan. At war with that which saved your soul, such irony marks this tragic scene. Not so tragic, however, as your hot couture, adults in waifs' nightgowns. Is this Halloween? Does this thing ever shut up? <laughs> Subdue it, Dinah. Don't strangle it. He, he killed him. He killed Ollie. Twas necessary, child bearer in denial. Queen's death shroud complete with that last fiery stitch. But if it's death you desire to sate your fierce bile, I offer you yours, you foul stinking. Hey, that didn't rhyme. I just want to pause for a moment and be like, I can't believe DC let this go. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to write, a, as a parent, a strongly worded letter to this comic book company. <laughs> uh, hey, that didn't rhyme with mine. And then I come in. You know, I never do this kind of thing, but you're just too cute for words. Mm -hmm. Hey, I know I'm no Dr. Midnight, but geez. That Kids is a reference to a very tiny storyline where Dinah and Dr. Midnight had a brief, brief dalliance. But while I was writing this comic, while Ollie was dead. So I, as a big continuity whore, I got to reference that and I felt so cool, but I don't think there's anybody left alive that even remembers that scene. Oh. <laughs> I think I'm gonna be sick. Can't tell you how long it's been since I laid a nice uh, wet one on a hot babe. Probably longer for you though, huh, Bats? Brand. At your service. Looks like I missed one hell of a party. Are you going to explain or what? Etrigan's gone. Its body, however, is now inhabited by a spirit named Boston Brand. Dead man to some kids. You mind if I revert this old thing back to Jason Blood? He's a little easier to control. Gone, gone now, Etrigan, and rise again, the form of man. So now this guy's possessed by a ghost? A friendly ghost, Junior, like Casper. Then where did the demon go? Oh, he's still in here, right alongside of Blood. The two of them are trying to give me the bum's rush, though. So I'm gonna beat a path right after I make with the message. What message? Ollie's okay. Hal pulled him out of the mix before Etrigan had a chance to fry him. Hal? Yes, seems none of our departed ranks does that to stay dead anymore. Where are they, Brand? The hereafter. Don't worry, though, they're just visiting. Ollie's getting the skinny on just what happened to him. Would you look at that? No wonder Blood's always so moody. That's because he's looking down. He indicates that Jason Blood is not well hung. Oh my God. I, I just have to explain. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> when are they coming back? Uh, don't know, but I wouldn't stick around here waiting for him if, you, if I were you guys. There's a lot that's gotta be explained. Should I only try to do that in a Boston accent? The last line only. Okay. I don't know. I wouldn't stick around here waiting for him if I was used guy. No, nah, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that nice I, uh, I hope they start releasing audio versions of comic books so that we can listen to the nine and a half hour unabridged version of you reading this comic. Yes, annotated. I, I think there all is a market in. for the annotated comic book reading. Especially with a, I'm all with in, a, with sir. a writer or an artist who has a lot to explain. Like, well, this is what I was thinking when I did this. Yours would be like 48 hours long. <laughs> Pretty much. I got a lot to explain what I do. All right, that does it for us today. Thank you so much, Kevin Smith, for joining us on DC Daily. We loved having you. Awesome to be back. Uh, hopefully when they let us all be in the same place again, you guys will have me in the same room. Not just with this one, but oh. with the other DC Daily stars, like Bat Sam. And, and credit for, you know, not for nothing, we did just do a performance uh, out loud and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm no Steven Spielberg, but as a director, kids, I thought you did great. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks, pal. I didn't ask for any retakes. I wasn't sitting there going, oh, there's no truth in that line. Go again. Bring truth to it. You can all read Kevin's run on Green Arrow, his run Quiver with artist Phil Hester, right here on DC Universe. And as for us, we're going to go probably watch Mall Rats for the millionth time. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye.